morning. Welcome to the Chickawaga Senior Center and our University Express class today. Welcome to those that are watching from home. Um, today's class we're very lucky to have um, is the history of beer in Buffalo. Uh, we'd like to thank University Express, everybody who uh, has a part in that, especially Erie County uh, with um, Katie Earle, uh, Lisa, and Kitty who make University Express possible. Um, Herzog, correct. Very good. All right. Tim Herzog began home brewing back in 1981 and went down the slippery slope. Stops included founding the Sultans of Swig Home Brewing Club, the New York State Craft Brewers Association, becoming a nationally certified beer judge. Oh, that sounds neat. And serving two terms on the National Brewers Association Government Affairs Committee. In his spare time, he founded and built the Fine Bison Brewing Company. Tim retired in November of 2022, and here he is to talk about the history of beer in Buffalo. So thank you very much for being here, Tim. Really Thanks, so. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Save your applause. You may wish to take it back at the end. So uh, I have to apologize for the voice. Uh, I am seven days back from Germany. Uh, and evidently, I had a good time in Germany. So uh, Viking River Cruise. If you ever get a chance, take them. There's my speech on that. So today we're going to talk about uh, what beer has done for Buffalo and, and kind of how and when that happened. And um, I would encourage you, because every class so far, there's been somebody who has a really personal connection with something we're going to talk about. So one of my neighbors, she just lives a couple blocks from me. It turns out her dad worked at Stein's Brewery. And while he was working on the canning line one day, he sent an empty can through uh, with some couple of nuts and bolts in it and caught it off the end once the cap was put on it. That was her rattle. So when she grew up, one of her toys was the Stein's beer can. So, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. Not everybody can tell that story, but um, beer has been good for Buffalo. And uh, Buffalo likes beer. Let's try again. Down arrows, but it worked before. Yeah. Right. Here we go. Yay, technology. So first I want to talk about how beer is made, real briefly. Not gonna walk out of here, brewers, but so we're all talking the same language. So we're all talking about the same things. And, and the kind of beer that I'm gonna be talking about is not, there's so much on the shelf today that I don't consider beer, right? I like beer flavored beer. And, you know, graham cracker, lime, apple pie, sour IPA, um, I would not call that a beer. Um, that's it's just me. So the beers we're going to be talking about are made from four ingredients, maybe a fifth. So malted barley, which is grain. Hops are flowers of the plant. Water, which there's a lot of it around here. Uh, yeast, which makes it all go. The other thing that could fit in here is malted wheat, which is also a grain. So those that's our shopping list. So malted barley. The grain you see over there, that's barley. Um, if you've ever taken the 190, you've seen this building. It's still there. Uh, but if you take this stack off of it and you put Agway on, on there, that might look more familiar to you. So that was the Curtis Malting Works. It was an Agway grain storage, kind of an indoor silo uh, for a long, long time. And uh, this Erie Canal here in the very foreground is actually now the 190 Expressway. So do you know how they took that from liquid to solid? And the, pardon? Yeah. Two years worth of garbage from the city of Buffalo filled in the Erie Canal. And imagine the guys who dug it out, now you're watching them dump garbage into that ditch that you dug with your own hands. You know, I would be so happy about that. So anyway, there were a number of vaulting works in, in Buffalo and a number of breweries have their own. Um, if you happen to go to Flying Bison Brewing Company in their tap room, if you turn and look out the windows, you can see the top of this building. This was Buffalo Malting. It's over on Elk Street. And now there's a little brewery in here uh, and a barbershop. You know, so you can get a trim. 
I didn't have to go out and get my hair trimmed and have a couple beers at Briar Brothers while I'm there. Uh, this is Kleinschmidt Malting, and it's notice it's a fairly small building. They just did specialty maltings for uh, Iroquois, which was across the street. And Iroquois was an enormous brewery uh, for the city of Buffalo. They distributed around the Northeast at their peak. Uh, these guys just did specialty malts. They didn't do the pale malts, which is what most beer is made up of. Uh, so we'll see that here. So malting is where you, you take the kernels off the, the stalk, you soak them in water until they absorb 40% of their own weight in moisture. You put them in a shallow bed in a humid, warm room uh, and turn them frequently until they start to sprout. Then you knock those sprouts off and dry the grain down to less than 5% moisture, and you've got pale malted barley. That's gonna make you a yellow beer. Or you can take that grain at any point during the drying with a little moisture left or completely dry and toast it or roast it to amber, brown, golden, black. And then it's up to the brewer to mix and match those different colors and flavors that you've produced from the roasting and toasting to make whatever beer they desire. Now, here's the line that, that's usually drawn for most people. I will say Guinness. And a lot of people, oh, uh, uh. I mean, the faces are just comical from up here. So this is why I do it. It's the entertainment that you provide. Um, Guinness is a pitch black beer. Okay? It is 95% pale malted barley. It's a yellow beer. And then it's 3% flaked torrified pale malted barley. So at 98%, it's still a yellow beer. And then it's 2% roasted barley, which is where that espresso uh, coffee kind of flavor comes from in Guinness. So just, just 2%, that's all it is. So, and if you think I'm lying to you, the next time you're in a pub that sells Guinness on draft, take a look at a pint when it's poured, look at the foam. The beer might be black, but the foam is white. There's not enough toasted or roasted barley in there to even color the foam on the beer. So give Guinness a chance. It's also the first light beer, the first low calorie beer, the first low alcohol beer. So uh, hops. So these bright green pellets that you're looking at in my hand, uh, those are the flowers from the plant. So hops grow on a vine that begins with a B as opposed to a vine. So grapes grow on vines. You can train them across a fence and make them accessible and easy to pick, right? If you try and train a vine across a fence, you don't let it grow straight up, then it, you're gonna stunt the plant and it won't flower very well and you will have wasted a lot of time, right? So the format that most brewers use now is these flowers are dried and then crushed and pressed down into a dye, into a tube, and then a smaller tube, then a smaller tube, until they, the oils break out and they start to stick together. And they break off into little pellets and they look like rabbit food. Not the pellets that come out of the other end of the rabbit, but the pellets that you put in the front end of the rabbit. So they look like rabbit food. Um, and those are very convenient for brewers to use. They're easy to store. Um, they're, they, they retain their freshness if you keep them sealed and chilled. Um, so that helps out a lot. So since we're talking about history, in 1916, New York State exported more hops to the whole world than the country of England did. Uh, if I said England and beer and hops, you'd probably all shake, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. New York State, not so much. If I told you there's over 200 breweries in New York State right now, it would probably shock you. Um, so New York has been a good beer state over time. So the hop belt, so this area just south of us where it's a little flatter, uh, is, was grain. The hop belt was Ithaca to Poughkeepsie. There were a couple of people who tried, uh, hop growing in more recent times. And what they found out is it's 10 to $12,000 an acre to set up the infrastructure to grow hops. And it might take you three years before you can get a commercial crop. And then you've got to at least dry them and seal them and refrigerate them while you're getting customers to buy them. And they all are growing something else other than hops right now. So it's a tough crop. 
water. We live on two fifths of all the world's fresh water. You're going to set up a lot of bathhouses or you're going to set up a lot of breweries. I vote breweries. There's only so many baths a day you can take. There seems to be an infinite number of beers you can have in a day if you pace yourself. So the good thing about the water that, that we get, it comes out of Lake Erie. No iron, no sulfur, low in magnesium and calcium and the long chain minerals, right? There is a fair amount of lime in it, but lime will break out during the boil. So if you want to do a science experiment at home, just take some water out of your tap, boil it. Once it's boiling, turn off your burner, let it sit overnight, and the next morning it'll look like somebody threw a handful of sea salt in the bottom of your pan. That's the lime. So boiling and cooling will break that lime out so it has no effect on your beer to speak of. Um, and that's part of the brewing process. Boil it, cool it. It's part of brewing. So the water around here is great for brewing beer. I've only been doing it for 42 years. I think you can take my word. So here's where the history part starts. So the name of our city, there was never any yaks here. There were never any bison not even in prehistoric times, okay? So the buffalo thing is a complete mistake. These are French words. This means pretty, pretty. beau means pretty, fleuve means river, the pretty river. So the French fur trappers that came around the north side of the lake crossed at the narrow point of Lake Erie and saw this river that just wound and snaked back and forth. So there was lots of habitat for mink and muskrat and raccoon and all sorts of other things to catch them, kill them, skin them, tan up the hides and sell pelts. So it was pretty. It was full of animals for them to get fur from. It was a pretty river. It was a beau fleuve. And the English and, and became American settlers uh, heard buffalo from beau fleuve. So there you are. So there's where Buffalo comes from. The first actual registered inhabitant to build a building and say, I own this land and I'm going to live here was Joseph Hodges in 1789. In the area where he set up is not what we would call downtown Buffalo today. It was a little farther upstream on the Niagara. And the area was originally referred to as Sandy Town. And we know it today as either Black Rock or Riverside. When Flying Bison first opened, we were on Ontario Street, and I would just say on Ontario Street, because if I said Black Rock, whoever I was talking to would say, no, this is Riverside, you don't know what you're talking about. And if I said Riverside, oh no, this is Black Rock, you don't know what you're talking about. So it was on Ontario Street, in the Ontario Street part of town. So uh, that's where Mr. Hodges uh, began to settle. Uh, 1795, more people start coming, fur trappers, these uh, people seeing land, farmers, they could spread out a little bit, they could get some land, they could build themselves a life. There is a, there are records of 1811 crops being sold and traded uh, in Sandytown, the area that's now Tonawanda, and up into southern Niagara County. That was where the farmers were headed. In 1812, Joseph Webb opens a brewery in the village of Sandytown in the Ontario Street part of the city. <clears throat> His timing was very unfortunate because a year later, the British came over and burned everything to the ground. In 1813, in the War of 1812, started in 1813. Does that bother anybody? <laughs> So when I say brewery, we're not talking about factories. This was Hoffman's Brewery, and this was at uh, an area called, well, near Cold Spring. Uh, this was at Main Street and uh, St. Paul, which is Tupper-ish street area, right? So this would be maybe a store, maybe some rooms up here. This is wall to the left kind of cabin looking building, that would be the brewery area. That's where the beer was made. That's where the beer was served, sold. There were no kegs, there were no bottles, there were no barrels leaving the site. There were no bars and restaurants. 
if you wanted beer, you went to the brewery and you drank a beer with the brewer, and then you went home. Does that sound familiar to anybody who's ever been flying by? <laughs> So we're just recreating history. So the early brewers, 1824, three Brits get together, uh, King, Peacock, and Relay. Uh, and they're downtown um, in the area of Maine or Franklin. Streets weren't as clearly defined as they are today. Um, and, and down closer to Court Street. So that area. In 1824, the Erie Canal is also completed, dedicated, and opened. So now traffic is really starting to come into Buffalo. Immigrants are coming here on barges, looking for work, looking for land. Uh, in 1828, Moffat and Rudolph Bear, who was also referred to as Rudolph Barr, as his name got Americanized, uh, and Cold Spring, which is Maine and Ferry. Now, if you were leaving the city, you had that long carriage ride out to Cold Spring. So remember the city is setting up down near Court Street, and you got to ride all the way to Maine and Ferry. You're going to be pretty thirsty. So you're going to need a beer. Uh, also, there is a spring that's been channeled underground. So Skijakwita Creek uh, and some of the tributaries there have been channeled underground, and it runs underneath the parking ramp at Canisius College. So um, in 1830, Jacob Bruce starts the brewery that will eventually become Iroquois. In 1842, Joseph Dart uh, completes and demonstrates his steam-powered grain elevator. And many of those were wood, and they were box-shaped, so there was a lot of friction, and they tended to explode. Uh, in 1870, we're going to see kind of the peak of the tavern breweries, like the picture of the Hoffman Brewery that I showed you, right? uh, Industrial Revolution, and so forth. So here's an actual photograph of Rudolph Bars. Brewery, and again, it doesn't look like a brewery. So you know, there's some chimneys, so he's probably drying some grain in there, probably leasing these rooms on the top two floors, something in a store, general store, something like that downstairs, and then an area where he could make beer, and you could get a mug o beer with Rudolph Bar at Main and West Ferry Street. Beer on the front. There we go. So, 1840 to 1860, we're seeing the Industrial Revolution and the effects thereof on the brewing industry and things that are kind of invented by the brewing industry coming back into other types of industrial situations. And we'll see that with every major, see it with World War I, we'll see it with World War II, things that were invented for war. Help the brewing industry, things that were invented for the brewing industry, help the war effort and the industrialization of America. So uh, here we have the uh, uh, Haas Brewery. Uh, and then here's some of his handsome workers. Hey, look at these guys, handsome mustaches. What a good look for a brewer. Huh? So the Industrial Revolution comes to Buffalo. Erie Canal is in its heyday. The canal district down behind Pearl Street Brewery over to where the grain elevators are. There's lots of small canals. There's lots of port. There's lots of boats tying up. There's lots of hay sailor going on down there. But with that comes a lot of immigration. And a lot of the immigrants that came to Buffalo were Germans. They were looking for religious freedom, political freedom, work, land. Remember, there's kind of a royal system over there, and if the Kaiser didn't like you, then Kaiser really didn't like you. So they were here for a lot of freedom. Um, and they brought with them an unslakable thirst. So a lot of the immigrants that settled in Buffalo in particular came from cultures where there were bigger cities than what Buffalo was. The water supplies in those cities were really sewers they were really clean streams and rivers. So from bubonic plague time onward, these people were drinking beer and wine as their daily drink, fermented cider perhaps. Uh, that was very popular. There were apple trees uh, in Niagara County real quick. So cider was probably the first drink even before beer. Um, 
but these guys were drinking beer with lunch, beer with dinner, beer when they were thirsty, because the water was unsafe in the cities where they came from. So the you know that beer cured the bubonic plague. Do you know this? You didn't learn this in grammar school? <laughs> no, of course not. Nobody did. Um, there are three saints that are saints because they cured the bubonic plague in their country. Uh, saint, uh, saint Augustine, Germany, Saint Bridget, Ireland, and and uh, Belgian guy, uh, saint, saint Arnoldus in in Belgium. And they lived in monasteries, and they had wells on their property, and they made beer, they made wine. They had people come and stay there because monasteries tended to be walled in so people could sleep safely as they were traveling. They weren't drinking out of the local river slash stream slash sewer. And that's what started, using that water is what started the bubonic plague staying away from drinking that, or at least recognizing, let's get our water upstream and sewer downstream, you know, that, that at least helped to uh, abate it. So beer cures the bubonic plague, you heard it here. In 1846, factory breweries start to appear. Brewers start to get the idea that I can only make and sell so much beer in this little cabin, I've got to be able to sell it somewhere else. So they started building places that were called barrel houses. And you've seen photographs, and they're usually sepia tone, kind of browns and blacks, of a bunch of very handsome fellows with mustaches and derbies and, and mugs of beer. And they're standing at this bar that seems to go on forever. It's very long and it's very dark. Well, what a barrel house was, was a very long, narrow building because property taxes were charged by frontage. So a skinny building, could be a mile long. It's a cheap building. So that bar went on forever. They sold the beer at a very low price. And in a barrel house, you had two choices. You could have another beer or you could get out. There was no spirits. There was no cider. There was no wine. There was no food. Eventually, they started to add some salty food. Pretzel, ham sandwich, ham soup, a lot of salt. Wow, suddenly I'm thirsty. I'll have another beer. What a good idea. So the, the barrel house that started to appear, that's what became the saloon, that's what became the bar, that's what became the restaurant. So that's what the family tree looks like there. So take a look at this one. 1857, 1 1.5 million gallons brewed and consumed in the city of Buffalo. Now, the city of Buffalo is tougher to South Park. It's a very compact city. There's a fair number of people living here, but every drop of beer that's consumed in the city was brewed in the city. There was no Labatt's, there was no Budweiser, there was no Heineken, there was no Guinness, there was no beer being shipped in. They hadn't really started to use bottles, cans hadn't even been invented yet, so shipping beer in or out is not really, you're going to get fresh beer local, and it's starting to become more consistent. Before this time, when you dried the barley, you dried it over a fire. So stuff that was closer to the fire would be black, and the stuff that was farther from the fire would be a little, a little more damp, a little lighter in color, and it might rot faster, so you, you got thrown away. But it could be dark, it could be amber, it could be black, it could be real smoky, it could be a little smoky. So what was beer back then is not something that any of us would say, wow, I'll have another. It just wasn't. Um, so there are 19 breweries within that space in the city, right? Mostly small little cabin breweries, but beer is a thing in Buffalo. So. This becomes the, one of the precursors for prohibition, right? The saloon system. So, uh, here. In 1886, there are 500 saloons. People weren't buying beer by the six pack and taking it home. They were going to the saloon to drink, and usually spirits, rum, and increasingly whiskey are consumed with beer, just 
because that started to happen. Um, people weren't taking booze home. They were consuming it in the saloon. So they would stop on their way home and have their drinks. They might get home in less than perfect condition and late for dinner and unhappy with the wife because she was unhappy with the husband. And you know what that leads to. Uh, not a card game, is the answer. Um, in 1886, there's 500 saloons in Buffalo. Lang's Brewery alone owned 80, so almost a fifth of all the saloons in Buffalo owned by one brewer. And that led to a kind of a company store thing. If you worked at the brewery, you would go to the saloon because that's where cash was coming over the bar. You would turn in your receipt for your paycheck and you would get some cash and some chips that are only good at the bar. So you're either going to stay there and drink or you're going to buy your friends at the bar a drink. You're probably not going to walk out of the bar that day with any of those chips in your pocket. And you're probably not going to walk out of the bar in a real straight condition either. Because if you buy somebody a drink, what happens? It usually comes back. And this is really what helped develop that. I mean, Buffalo is one of the friendliest places on the planet. Right? I've been all over Europe, been all over the United States. Buffalo is one of the friendliest places on the planet where a stranger might buy you a beer just because you look like you need one. Or a you know, cocktail or glass of wine or whatever. There, there is some tradition, there is some root for that. It was get rid of those chips so that you got home in some kind of condition where you could deal with your wife and your kids and paint your windowsills and so forth. So <clears throat> based on the population figures, it's about one saloon for every 100 residents. I know it feels like there's a lot of places in Buffalo now, but imagine that concentration of them. And again, we're just talking about the city. Tupper, South Park. So that's a lot. So the boss saloons, company store kind of thing, you, you were going to be walking out of there without your chips, maybe without some of your paycheck. So in 1854, the Courier uh, printed that at the end of the year there were 2,135 arrests that had some component of drunk and disorderly conduct. Okay. City of good neighbors, right? <laughs> In 1855, you're up by over 200. So at least four more a week, this is going in the wrong direction. So when the Anti-Saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union start to gain some ears in Congress uh, and a little traction, these kind of numbers prove their point, that men are irresponsible. <laughs> So, uh, taxes, one of the things that brewers and, and uh, anybody who makes spirits or wine cider deal with taxes, um, a lot, a lot of taxes. And three, we have three entities now. The first one started during the Civil War, where the brewers in the North, who are becoming factory brewers, agreed to pay <clears throat> 12 and a half cents on every eighth of a barrel. So one dollar a barrel um, to the government, and that was used to buy guns and ammunition and uniforms and boots and horses and food for soldiers in the Civil War. And the original idea was, we'll do this to help the North win the war so we can get back to a country, get back to a life. Um, do taxes ever go away? Okay, good. You got this right. We're done then. Uh, so this happens to be a, a, a real tax stamp. Do you remember going to the liquor store and there was like a piece of tape across the bottle? No. Does that color look familiar? So that was a tax stamp. Right? Tax has been paid on this bottle of spirits. So on a half barrel of beer, there'd be four of these things. Stapled, taped, glued, whatever, onto the barrel. Right? This one happens to be from the Jost Brewing Company. December 3rd, 1869. Okay, so this is a real deal. This is from Dave Mick's collection of paraphernalia. Or brewery on it, depending on how you want to look at it. So now, um, 
sort of 1865, 1868. Um, I wish the date off the end when I crop this. Uh, so this is German American Brewery, and it's on Main Street and High Street. So it's near right where the parking lots are for uh, Buffalo General Hospital. The last bit of this, you will all remember, there was a big, tall, white, rectangular building. It was really white, near the corner of Main and High. And that was the office complex for the German American Brewing Company. So this is it in its earlier days. Nope, they're delivering barrels. So they're going to saloons, um, barrel houses. So beer is starting to be consumed in more places other than just a small cabin brewery. Factory, they're malting their own grain, big stack. So they've got some big heat going on there. The innovations that are starting to happen, steam engines, uh, steam heat. So you can pump that steam, push that steam through a pipe, warm a room or a bed full of grain without having to use fire. So now the color of your beer is controllable. The flavor of your beer is much more controllable. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're also away from pewter and wood as the Czechs and the Brits have figured out how to make glass and how to make it commercially. So now we've got these yellow beers now we can see how pretty and yellow they are rather than smoky and cloudy and you know, some little bits of ash in the foam. Um, also, the Germans and the Danes have developed lager yeast, which ferments at cooler temperature. So it works slower. And if you lay it down in a cool place, it will settle down to the bottom all on its own and give you this brilliantly clear beer that looks like the beer that we would recognize today. Also, in Buffalo, one of the things everyone complains about is cold weather. Well, cold weather freezes the lakes and ponds and streams and rivers. And you harvest that ice, roll it in straw, put it down in a cave below your brewery, and you've got a refrigerator, primitive refrigerator. So they can control the temperature of the fermentation and the aging by having those chunks of ice down there. So these are things that will help the food industry as time goes by, but they were developed for the brewing industry. Do you really think Louis Pasteur was working that hard so he could make milk last <laughs> long on your kitchen counter? No, he was working with Gabriel Settlemeyer and Mr. Carlsberg to develop pure ways to, to hold and select and preserve yeast for wineries and breweries. So, Breweries are getting bigger, right? Um, 1894, the Lang Brewery, this was referred to as the Brewer's Palace. Right? Remember, they own over 80 saloons just here in Buffalo. They're starting to ship beer to Rochester, to Dunkirk. Uh, 120 handsome young fellas with their lip protectors on. <laughs> the, notice the fountain. And the, and the manicured gardens at the front. This is at um, uh, Jefferson and Best Street, so where Roswell Park is right now. That's where that brewery was. Now think about that location. The German American brewery was at Main and Hyatt, less than four blocks away. And the uh, um, Ziegler family brewery was at Main and Virginia, less than eight blocks away. And then less than two blocks away was the Christian Wayans Brewery. And these are all big factory breweries by this time. Again, there's no Budweiser, no Schlitz, no Schmitz, no Strohs, no Coors, no Heineken coming in. 1894, 120 men working in the brewery. Plus, they have their own stables. They have their own wagons. They have their own horses. That's how the beer is being delivered. Trolley, Buffalo has a great trolley system. Um, we're a few years before the car and the truck yet, but they're on their way. In 1901, the world literally came to Buffalo. Pan American Exposition was one of the biggest and least financially successful exhibitions ever held in the world. Buff State, Albright Knox, Delaware Park, that kind of area. 
Uh, on Delaware near the 198, there's a small house and it says something about Pan Am on it. That was one of the ticket gates. Okay. If you drive Elmwood Avenue or Delaware Avenue from the city and you're going north towards Tonawanda, you're going to go underneath a railroad track before Hurdle Avenue. That rail line was originally built to bring people into the Pan American Exposition. So that ran through the north side of the, of the grounds. So brass bands, lots of, uh, lots of hoopla going on here. The title for this gate is Alt Nuremberg. Buffalo is a very German city. They have very German brewers. They have very German beer. Okay, this is gonna come into play in a few years. This, I know it's hard to see, in the upper right corner, there's a circular logo, and that's from the Pabst Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So even in Milwaukee, they had heard about the prodigious brewing and drinking talents of the city of Buffalo, and they wanted in on this worldwide exhibition because they wanted to be a big brewing power. So they bought a building and, and uh, exhibited at the, uh, at the Pan Am. External electricity, you can see some of the poles, you can see some wires in here. First time ever, you can have electric light outside. In Buffalo, because of the falls, hydroelectric power, some of the bigger houses in Buffalo had their own electrical systems being put in, but now street lights are starting to show up. A bigger light out in front of your store, or your brewery, your restaurant, or whatever, can you know, bring in customers. So electricity is becoming a commodity, it's becoming a big deal. Uh, of course, the president gets shot here, you know. Um, but these buildings are all chicken wire and paper mache and plaster. They were all built to be temporary. There was one building, the Pan Am ex exhibition, uh, that was built as a permanent building and we now call it the Erie County Historical Society. All right, that building was, that was the New York State Agricultural Building and it's now the, uh, <clears throat> the Hysterical Society. And a lot of these pictures came from that. So this was the Ziegler family brewery. This is the rebuild of it. It was originally on Dean and Virginia. This is actually Washington Street. Washington Street was never this grand. Okay. So what exists now is take where that where it says Phoenix Brewery at the top and just put your arm over there from there to the right. That's all gone. That became part of Trico. Okay. So diagonally across the street from here at Maine and Goodell was uh, the Christian Wayans Brewery, which became the Courier Express Brewery, and it's now owned by the Diocese of Buffalo. Right. Behind this building, so on the left part of the picture, where it shows a stable, uh, that's where Ulrich's Tavern is. So that was built in 1868. There's lots of good stories to go with that. So, these two pictures show the Iroquois Brewery and the Simon Brewery, and they were the last two breweries in Buffalo to close. And Iroquois was the biggest. They kind of pushed Langs. Langs was the biggest to a certain point in time, probably just before Prohibition. Uh, Iroquois was able to push on after that. You can see the size of it. It takes up blocks. Uh, Simon Brewery takes up at least a city block. These are big factory breweries. Buffalo's drinking a lot of beer. And again, there's not much being pushed in here in 1900. <clears throat> hundreds and hundreds of brewers and uh, related employees work here. Brewing is a great business because it keeps farmers busy, keeps uh, horse breeders busy, carpenters to build wagons, coopers to build barrels, scientists in what's becoming the labs in the brewery. <laughs> so it's it's really uh, a business that, that supports a lot of other businesses in the community. So step forward a few years, 1914, World War One. How does it affect the brewing industry? Well, besides the fact that a lot of young men were killed all around the world, 
Frenchmen, uh, Brits, Englishmen, uh, uh, Germans, of course, Americans. Um, we have rationing in the country. So a lot of the grain, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that would have gone into beer is being sent overseas to make bread and food for the soldiers. Excuse me. So we have to ration here. There's supply interruptions of everything from wood to paper to grain to horses to anything. One of the developments of World War I that's, that's not really thought of all that much is aviation. So airplanes are starting to be used in war. Drop a grenade into the top of a factory and you can make a big mess out of it. <coughs> but that's also going to help people move around the country. That's also going to bring more immigrants here at some time. It's going to bring tourists here. It's going to bring, uh, it's also going to be at least three factories in the city of Buffalo. There were huge airplane factories. What do those guys drink? But negative side, anti-immigrant start in that show. It's bad to be German. The Germans were the mean people. They were the Huns. So that's going to have an even greater effect after the next war to end all wars. So in 1910, this is Phoenix Brewery. So the Ziegler family brewery that I showed you was on Maine and uh, Maine and Virginia. They had a fire. Two of their employees died. Mr. Ziegler was absolutely heartbroken. He was a real family man, a real Buffalo booster. So when he built the new brewery, which you saw the picture of, and you can see it, this is it here. It's now called the Phoenix Lofts. So that, that part of the building still stands. And I can attest to it because we rented space in that building for a while. It's three courses of brick, thick, bottom wall, two on the second floor, one on the third floor. You can't make, knock that building down. And then there's a Medina sandstone foundation, and those blocks are I don't know, easily two feet thick. This is a Pierce Arrow truck. Trucks built in Buffalo, delivering beer made in Buffalo to people who live in Buffalo. It's a great business for the city of Buffalo. These are empty barrels. You look at them stacked on the back of the truck. There's no way that 80 pound half barrels are gonna get stacked that high by those two guys. The little spaghetti arms on this guy. <laughs> so along comes prohibition. Buffalo goes from 20 breweries, factory and tavern sized breweries, before Prohibition, two years after Prohibition, seven. If your business, I don't care what your business is, cannot operate for 13 years, and then they say, well, all right, you can go back to it. If you're making washers and bolts, do you have money to buy the metal to make the washers and bolts? You know, it's just, it, Prohibition absolutely devastated the city of Buffalo. People say, well, you know, it was when Bethlehem Steel, that was a drop in the bucket compared to what Prohibition did. So farmers lost out, brewers, bankers, uh, stable hands, coopers, scientists, brewers, monsters, all gone, all gone, can't have it. So a number of them went into other industries. So Broadway Brewing Company became an electrical firm uh, that still exists. Uh, have you ever heard of Ur Supply? IRR pipes. If, if you've got a bathroom in your house, you have something that came through Ur Supply. Frederick Ur was a brewer at Ziegler Family Brewery. Right? He started this. So they had to do something to make money for their family. They had to go into some sort of business. Uh, Zamenagel, which still exists, started by Mr. Zom, who was one of the, uh, who was a brewer at uh, Simon. So, you know, when life gives you lemons, you know, you try and make lemonade out of it. The other thing is some people tried to stay in business. So one of the things that was allowed, so prohibition was you could not make it, you could not move it, you could not import it, you could not export it, you could not sell it. You could have a bottle of beer in your house. You could drink that bottle of beer. 
Because if they said no, then that would be, you know, unconstitutional, like liberty and the pursuit of happiness. But how are you going to get it there? So if they catch you with beer at your house, well, where did you get it? They go after the people that sold it to you. They go after the people that made it. <clears throat> near beer and prescriptions. Those look a little funny to you. So near beer is any non non-alcoholic beer, which the the level of alcohol accepted was set at 0.5 percent. You know where that number comes from? That's how much alcohol there is in a quart of homemade sauerkraut. <laughs> Remember, we're a very German city. So if mama is allowed to make sauerkraut, and that's half a percent of alcohol, you have to allow a half percent of alcohol in a beverage. Okay? So they're very strict on it. Um, there's a lot of NA beers starting to hit the market now. So the government, particularly the state, is coming down really hard. Anybody that's making NA beer, you've got point. 0.05% room for error. So 0.45 to 0.55 is your window. If you're outside that, also, that gave them the great idea that, hey, we can start testing all these small breweries and make sure that if they say it's 6%, it's 6%. If they say it's 8 it's 8 so there's a brewery in central New York that got fined by the states for, you know, for a visit. And they thought that the $10,000 fine was for the visit. They had beer that was out of, and it's again, 0.5%. It's not per visit, it's per sample. That visit didn't cost them $10,000, it cost them $70,000 because their beers were more than 0.5% on the spectrum. So, beware the government. Um, or do your job. Do it right. You know, that's that's my side of it as a brewer. If if I'm making beer and it's, it's supposed to be 6%, I make sure it's 6%. It's supposed to be 7 I make sure it's 7 So anyway, um, people did have prescription for something that was called malt time that was made by breweries. And it was eventually kind of condensed to a syrup so that you could take it and a tablespoon of it, mix it in some warm water to make your malt tonic. Uh, so near beer we talked about, the malt tonic got to the point where the cans of it on the label said, do not allow this entire can to be mixed with three gallons of warm water and allow it to come into contact with Fleischmann's Baker's yeast and, and sit in a crock for up to five days or alcoholic beer may result. <laughs> oh, doctor, I need malt tonic. Oh, doctor, I need malt tonic. So, <clears throat> so this is what it looked like in Buffalo before Prohibition. 2,150 bars, restaurants, 150 hotels, 95 stores, where you could get beer, wine, spirits, a drink. During Prohibition, the, a guy named Francis Xavier Schwab ran for mayor. And he ran on a platform of, if Prohibition comes to Buffalo, I will not enforce it. His job was, his day job, because back then mayor was a part-time job. His day job was he was the president and sales manager for the FX Kaltenbach Brewery at the corner of Bailey and Clinton. That building is still there. It's Battenfeld American Oil Processing. Okay. So Mr. Schwab is elected to two terms. What a shock. People in Buffalo elected an anti-prohibitionist to be mayor. He was the last mayor to sit in what we now call County Hall, which is on Franklin and Division. So he is the guy who commissioned the Art Deco City Hall that we now call City Hall. The first guy to sit in that building as mayor was a guy named Charles Resch. Does that name sound familiar to anybody? His great nephew, Charlie the Butcher. Come on, beer and roast beef. You couldn't figure that out. 
So, uh, Mayor Schwab is at Ulrich's Tavern one night. This is a true story. He was at Ulrich's Tavern one night. The bartender gets a call. Hey, they're going to raid you guys. They're looking for Mayor Schwab. They know he comes there. You know, they want to get him because they found real beer at his brewery. So that was another trick that the brewers did. If, if they were making four tanks of malt tonic or, or near beer, and there's two other tanks in there, there might be something else going on in there. So because of this next number. Um, so Mayor Schwab hightails it out of there. They get raided. They don't find him. He knows he's got to show up in court the next morning for his hearing. He walks in, you know, the photographers are there, mayor goes to jail, it's, you know, they, they're envisioning all these kind of sensational headlines. He walked in, paid his $35 fine, pleaded no contest, turned around and walked back out. There are no pictures, there's just the record of this transaction. He's also the guy, you, you know, this um, Ku Klux Klan in um, World War I, all that anti-immigrant sentiment starts moving north and they tried to establish a post in Buffalo and some local businessmen went in for that. And so he printed all their names in the newspaper. He took out an ad and printed all their names in the Courier Express and sent the Ku Klux Klan packet. So he was a brave man. Um, so anyway, during the prohibition, we have 8,000 Speakeasies. Now that could be someone's attic who had black curtains over the window and they just happened to be able to get a couple bottles of scotch or gin or something. Speakeasy, right? So anything from a room to you know, a public space this side. There was a place built during Prohibition called the Saturn Club in the big down yeah, Delaware Avenue. So some of the big movers and shakers were the Rumseys who owned most of the land that the city of Buffalo now sits on at one time. And as they sold it off piece by piece, they just got wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. Well, their daughter marries a guy named Elliot Ness, who was sent here to uh, from New York City to be an enforcement, prohibition enforcement officer. And so they get married. He catches wind, you know, talking to his wife that, oh, his parents were going to be entertaining some friends. As well, it's supposed to be a library. Well, they all like to read and they all like to, you know, talk about these books and, you know, Greek culture and Cicero. And, and <clears throat> so Mr. Ness and his helpers raid the place because every member has a locker and the, the member's the only one who has the key. So he breaks open all these lockers and he finds some bottles of brandy and some bottles of scotch. Oh, the help must have smuggled those in. But anyway, the Rumseys have to go to court. Two weeks later, Mr. Ness is on his way to Chicago. <laughs> so the Canadian effect of, so they had limited prohibition in Canada. They tried it with just beer for a while. That didn't work. They were thinking about trying alcohol. They look at it. It's, it's not working in the States. Let's just, let's just live with it. Okay. Now, I'm sure that this is all just a huge coincidence, right? During Prohibition, in two years, the Peace Bridge gets imagined, designed, built, and opened. Two years. During Prohibition. And during Prohibition, a number of the more influential and wealthy families go over to Canada and start buying property. And they helped to establish an amusement park on the shore of the lake. Uh, they they built big houses in Point Avenue, and the Good Years, and the Congers, and the, the Knoxes, and the um, Cornells, and all that. And then somebody gets the idea to build this big boat and take people back and forth across. I'm sure this is all just a coincidence that it happened during Prohibition. I'm sure it had nothing to do with the fact that you could go over there and legally drink beer and wine and cocktails and entertain your friends. I'm, I'm sure that's just a complete coincidence. So post-Prohibition, here's what we get from the government. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. 
federal excise tax goes up from one dollar a barrel to five dollars a barrel immediately overnight. Okay, you can make beer now, but you got to pay me two fifty for every half day. Blue laws, which until you know, we're still talking about blue laws, and right? one of my favorite ones. I did a lot of lobbying on behalf of the beer industry. Um, the guy that, that ran the, the Brewers, the National Brewers Association, for a number of years, his name was Charlie Papazian. Charlie used to say, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So that was how I got involved in the government affairs and lobbying and so forth. So one of my favorites was. Um, State or federal Senator Schumer comes into a joint session of the New York State Assembly and Senate. The governor's there, and I'm paraphrasing his fairly impassioned speech of, now imagine these poor football fans in Buffalo. <laughs> hey, on a Sunday morning, they just want to get a six pack of beer so they can have a beer before the game starts. And they don't have to pay 10 bucks for a warm flat miller and a paper cup. So you need to roll back off premise purchase from noon on Sunday to 8 a.m. on Sunday. Two days later, a bill's on the governor's desk and signed. So that was a blue law, peeled back, when the bills were playing in England. Well, we can't serve mimosas on Sunday morning because we can't serve until 10 a.m. and the game starts at 8.30. What do they get? A temporary permit that allows them, they had to pay $35 per restaurant that wanted to do it, but they got a temporary permit for that day because blue laws are a combination of laws and regulations put in by the liquor authority. The liquor authority is the most local form of government. So if the federal government says you can have booze and New York state says, no, you can't, then in New York state it's done. If the feds say yes and the state says yes and Erie County says no, in Erie County it's no. The feds, the state, the county say yes and the town of Williamsville says no, it's no. There's still dry towns in New York state still dry counties in, in Tennessee. So it's, it's this onion skin of, of uh, laws and regulations. <laughs> so we get state liquor authorities, we now get to pay state excise tax on top of federal excise tax, and you get to pay state sales tax if you're in a state where you're allowed to retail. And that was another sort of blue law that we got modified in 2014 that allows for a brewery to have a tap room where we can serve you a pint of beer, not just a six pack to take home or a keg to take home. You could actually have a, so that's why there are so many breweries in New York state. Go back to state records and look at how many were there before 2014, how many were there after 2014. Most of the new ones are tap room breweries. So we've gone full circle around to Hoffman Brewery on Main Street and Rudolph Bar at Main and West Ferry at Cold Spring. We're back to taproom breweries is where the local beers are found. We've barely shaken off World War I. Here comes World War II. More supply interruptions. It had become more of a global economy. You could buy grain from Germany and get it here in a reasonable amount of time. Excuse me, just sorry. Um, but there are innovations in transportation trucks, ships, planes, refrigerated containers, uh, dry containers, uh, bottles, cases for bottles, steel kegs instead of wooden barrels. Uh, lots of things come out of this. Uh, automation, bottling lines instead of fill and fill. And automation on a bottling line. All those things kind of came out of this time period. However, it's really bad to be German now. German American Bank is now the Liberty Bank. Uh, 
Lieber case is now meatloaf. Uh, you know, on and on and on and on. It's bad to be German. It's bad to be Asian. It's and the the brewing industry kind of responded with inventing beers. So this is where cream ale came from. They needed to be able to make beer in a hurry because they'd been low on beer for a long time. To prohibition in World War II. So the brewers figured out they could make a style of beer that was it was light and effervescent and very mild on the palate, but it could be ready in seven to ten days rather than six to eight weeks. And so they began to advertise this with this is lighter than those heavy European beers. Those beers are not heavy. But just put as many bad words as you can on that other brewery and uh, you know, uh, William Simon was smart. He changed the name from his in-laws brewery, which he became the president of. Yeah. He saw World War One coming and changed the name from, I think it was Captain Ruffer, to Simon Brewing. So they would push those buttons. There's a lot of anti-German sentiment. Let's play to it. Excuse me. <clears throat> this is important. There's a beer drinker born every minute. So the factory breweries get bigger, the small local breweries get smaller. Because those big factory breweries can ship, they got money. <clears throat> the more beer they make, the more money they have, the more they can lean on small local breweries. So here's Iroquois in 1950. Here's Simon in 1950. <clears throat> Notice that they look smaller than what you had seen before. A certain amount of that is instead of having 40 guys all filling one beer from one spout, you've got a bottling line, you've got automation, and you don't need so much space. So some of those buildings went away. Some of it is their malting works went away. They went to bigger companies out west to have grain malted for them and would get shipped in rail cars, bags, barrels, whatever. Um, so they didn't need quite so much space. You know what the Goodwill man? I said that, do you know what that means? Okay, in Buffalo, there's a bar in every corner. Okay, it's true, it's true. Especially back then, there's a small local neighborhood, bar, on almost every corner, especially in the city. We were a smaller, more compact city with nearly a million people living around there. So a lot of need for a lot of refreshments. And this is before the Buffalo Bills. So <clears throat> to try and fight against the, the big breweries having all that money and being able to do advertising. So now, you know, radio is becoming a thing. There's a radio in every house. When you get into the 60s, they're putting radios in cars. The big breweries are advertising on the radio. Small local breweries can't afford to do that. They're sponsoring the bowling team. They're doing events at the local YMCA, at the churches, at the, the, the little um, men's clubs that were built at the churches. They start painting their names on the side of the distributor's trucks. Now the distributors charge you $3,000 a year to have your name painted on the side of one of their trucks. So after a couple of years, that gets real expensive. Um, but the Goodwill man would drive around in a car with the brewery logo on it, and he would go into work in the morning, and he would get $200 cash. And they would say, go to Fast Eddie's and spend $50. Just buy everybody in your Iroquois and then go to the Buffalo Tavern and spend $20 by anybody who wants one in Iroquois and so on and so on and so on until that cash was depleted. Real story about what happened is I would know that he was gonna be at Fast Eddie's at 11.30 in the morning, right when they opened. So I would be like, oh, hey, Frank, good to see you. What a surprise. And I would be there, you know, <laughs> with my hat on and my overcoat and I would get my free beer and then when he would leave to go to the next place 
I would go to the next place and I would take off my hat, my overcoat, and just send my blazer, go in there. So it was a nice idea, but it, it kind of used pretty hard. So those programs didn't last all that long, but it, it, they tried to put a hometown touch onto their factory brewery. So this is where our local guys really get slaughtered. So national brands, and where a lot of this came from was Prohibition, right? Milwaukee was a smaller city than Buffalo during Prohibition. So who had more Prohibition enforcement officers? Buffalo. Milwaukee was able to brew some more beer, get it out the door, and have some money coming in. St. Louis was a cow town. They're on the western edge of the grain belt. Grain's there. There's a river there. They got water. They might have one prohibition officer buy him off, and there goes Budweiser. So these guys came in, especially in the 50s and 60s, and price forward the local breweries out of business. So Budweiser would come in, and if Simon was $2.99 a six pack, they'd come in at $2.79. And if their sales numbers didn't go up, they go to 269. If their sales numbers didn't go up, they go to 259. Once the sales numbers went up, that's where they would level off. And eventually, they go from 259 to 261 to 263. So they would eventually creep back, especially once the local breweries were gone. And advertising went from the Goodwill Man and the sponsorship of the bowling team and the parish events sponsoring kids' little leagues and, and giving away 12-inch rulers in the grocery stores and sold your beer to magazines, newspapers, media becomes a big factor in advertising. You know, if you've seen Mad Men or any of those kind of things where big Madison Avenue advertising firms really ruled a lot of American culture, Swanson TV dinners, Budweiser, 12-ounce, long neck, six-packs, all advertising. That food wasn't delicious, that beer wasn't locally beneficial and or delicious, but it sold because they told you that you had to have it. Um, so advertising goes that way. So the media outlets grow. And that becomes, yeah, that owns two newspapers, four newspapers, six newspapers. Now, Budweiser, Strohs, Schlitz, Smiths, whoever, can advertise with a group of newspapers and get their word across the country rather than just in one local market. Magazines, color pictures in magazines of that white frothy foam and that tall Pilsner glass with the little bead of sweat rolling down the side. <laughs> radio, there's radio in every house. Radios are going in every car. Televisions, televisions are going in every house. Who remembers Johnny Carson, Late Show with Ed McMahon they would wheel a cart off while he was standing there. Oh boy, a delicious Budweiser. And he'd have a super glass, you know, pour it right down the middle for a generous foam. You know, he'd hold it up like this because you weren't supposed to drink on TV. But as soon as the red light went off on the camera, <laughs> he did not send the beer back. So, but television became important for advertising. So what that led to is in 1970, Iroquois closed in 1972, Simon closed. Bill Simon IV still lives in Western New York. He wanted to go to brewer school and be part of the family business and his father would not let him. So he went to Chicago to architect school and he did uh, uh, landscape architecture for his career. But he still owns the property that Simon Brewery sat on they just, you know, nobody knows what to do with it. So, along comes the Buffalo Brew Pub in 1986, which is a bar restaurant that makes a little bit of beer and sells it on the premises. Does this sound familiar? It's not being distributed, it's sold on the premises. They opened up a factory style brewery in Lackawanna in 88, and it stayed about five years. Whether they were ahead of their time or they made some wrong decisions, I don't know. Uh, Queen City and Allen Street, those were both contract breweries where they would go to a brewery and go, we want a beer like this, 
you make it, put our name on it, we'll pay you this much per keg and this much per case out of the final price. They didn't last very long. Breckenridge Brew Pub opened in 95, Pearl Street in 1998. Flying Bison was the first distributing brewery to open since 1900. It was the first new brewing license that was issued inside the city of Buffalo in 100 years. So the reason for that is my original partner and I looked at the market and said there's 1,700 bar, restaurant, country club, running venue licenses in Erie and Niagara County. If we open a tap room or a pub brewery, we're competing with every single one of them. If we open a distributing brewery and we can hold on until a distributor picks us up, we have an opportunity to serve all 1,700 without being more than an hour's drive from the brewery. So we can get fresh beer into everyone's hands. And my kind of tell to the market was, people say, well, do you really think you can do this? People will put down their Labatt's and their Budweiser. There's not only room for us, there's room for a number of other breweries. And there's still huge displays, Budweiser and Labatt's in the grocery stores. And the small breweries are starting to close because they just can't hold on anymore. So uh, we're right back to, you know, the big breweries have the money and the small breweries can't afford to hold on. So there are currently 15 breweries inside the city of Buffalo. Buffalo is a bigger city, but 15 mostly taproom breweries inside the city of Buffalo. So there's lots of local beer being made. There could be a bright future. Everybody will put down their Labatt's and pick up a local beer. So my thanks to Erie County Historical Society. Stephen Powell wrote a book called Rushing the Growler, which you can find at the local. And that's a neat book because it goes brewery by brewery. So you can look up the name of a brewery and then just follow their history. So it's a nice, um, it's almost a catalog of breweries that existed up until about 2000 when it was published. He, he did uh, three publishings. Mike Rizzo and Ethan Cox, there there's, is a little more anecdotal. It's a little more of the flow of history um, of brewing in the city of Buffalo. Uh, a lot of the pictures that I got were from Dave Mick and John Ice. And Dave has three binders about this thick that are just full of just name, dates, times, places. Of, and he did a, a, a tour up until Prohibition with some friends. They'd rent a limo bus. You know, put a cooler in the back and go. This guy worked at this brewery from this year to this year. Put a red carnation on his grave, and go on to the next one. So he knows literally where the bodies are buried. And I thank you for your time this lovely Wednesday morning.